Hello and welcome to part one of homework one for this video series. In this part of the homework, we are taking a look at what is known as a cylindrical viscometer or some would refer to it as a coet cell. Essentially what this device is, I have it pictured here. And uh, what this device does, if you have any type of fluid and you want to measure the uh, viscosity of that fluid, uh, you would uh, use this machine here. So you would enter your fluid into the um, bottom uh, cylinder here, and um, you would lower this machine. So you would take this machine and take the top cylinder and lower it down to where it is sitting um, in the bottom cylinder. Now what happens is there's a motor, a little motor here at the top, and um, the top cylinder is basically attached just to a shaft from the, the, um, the outer cylinder surface. Um, to the motor, and when it turns, this device is able to calculate the viscosity of the fluid that you are trying to measure. So in, in this problem that we're given here, um, we're given the velocity profile in the angu angular direction and the gap between the two uh, concentric cylinders. So our, our cylinders, again, would be the one on the top and the one on the bottom. The one on the bottom uh, encasing the fluid and the one on the top is the one that is doing the rotating. Uh, where K is the ratio of inner to outer radii. So again, we have two different radii for the two different um, cylindrical, um, or two different cylinders. Um, so we have here the um, uh, V theta here equals omega times K squared over one minus K squared. And again, a K squared is the ratio of inner to outer radii. And then we have this multiplied by big R squared divided by R minus R. And we are given here that omega is the angular frequency in radians per second. So just the amount of, uh, of rotations. And uh, as a function of radial position R, we are asked to show that the torque on the inner and outer cylindrical surfaces are equal. And at the bottom here, we are given the shear rate in cylindrical coordinates. So essentially what it is asking us here is it's trying to get us to, to think about, first we have to visualize it before we can do any derivations. Um, so like I said, this top part is the one that's rotating and the bottom one is stationary. So you might think, well, there's only torque applied to the top one because that's the one that's attached to the motor. It's the one that's turning. And that's not really necessarily the case. Um, to give a good visualization of this, um, you can imagine stirring, uh, maybe you've made cookies or baked something in your lifetime, and you've had to use a mixer stirrer in the kitchen. Now, um, what we do when you put that mixer in your bowl and you start to stir? Well, you hold on to the bowl. You have to apply uh, a certain force to that bowl in order for the bowl not to rotate when you start the mixer. So what happens here is that the torque that's applied in one direction by the top here, this top cylinder that's turning with the motor, um, there has to be an equal torque in the opposite direction for the bottom one in order for the entire apparatus to not rotate or essentially break. Um, so I'm going to transition over into our whiteboard here, and I'm going to uh, draw this out on a uh, basically a bird's eye view so I can explain it a little bit better and then we will show here that the torque of both the inner and outer cylindrical surfaces are equal. So let's go ahead and do that. So I've gone ahead and written everything out here. Again, uh, just to reiterate, we have uh, we're given the velocity profile here for this process and we also are uh, given the shear rate for cylindrical coordinates, uh, which is this expression here. And here I have a diagram, and this looks um, from the top view down into the viscometer. So what we have here is the in inner circle here, or the, the inner cylinder. Again, this one is doing the rotating while the fluid um, it is drawn. I should have lines here, but the, uh, the inner circle here is the one rotating while the outer circle here is the one staying stationary. So what this problem is saying is that uh, this torque that um, the torque for the inner circle here 
there must be a torque also applied for the outer circle in order for the entire apparatus to stay still and not move. So it's saying that if there's torque this way for the inner circle, there must be the same magnitude of torque being applied to the outer circle in order for, um, again, the whole apparatus to, to not move around. So uh, if we take a look at this first, what we're going to want to find out is what is the torque here for this inner cylinder? Well, in order to find the torque, um, I'll give you a hint. Uh, because it involves both the force and the uh, what is known as the lever arm, um, we're going to need to find the shear rate for the um, inner for the surface of the inner cylinder. So what what we can do here is since we know the shear rate for cylindrical coordinates and we also have the velocity profile, we can go ahead and plug this into our velocity profile to find the shear rate at the surface of the um, the inner radius. So what we can do here is uh, just go ahead and plug this in. So we see that V theta here is divided by R. So we're going to go ahead and um, just do this step by step. This is sort of the longer process and knowing that we're going to need this to calculate the torque, I'm going to go ahead and do this first and then we could take a more conceptual look at uh, what, we, what other parameters we're going to need to calculate the torque. So um, substituting this in, we can divide by uh, R here. So I have uh, V theta divided by R, and we'll take this whole expression here and divide it by R. So we'll have omega, so we'll have our K squared, and then one minus K squared. And dividing by R here, this will leave us with R squared, or, or big R squared, I should say, over R squared minus one. Since these are multiplied together here, we can just divide it on this term. And it looks a lot better here because we can um, cancel these out into one and we'll also have R squared on the bottom. Uh, now what we can do is multiply by the derivative with respect to R. So we have uh, D dr derivative with respect to the uh, R uh, expression here. Multiply that by V theta over R. Uh, we still have our omega, excuse me, draw a mu there. Have omega, and we still have our k squared, 1 minus k squared. Now, taking the derivative here with respect to r, because that's uh, the step we're on, uh, we will end up with uh, negative 2r squared, and then add 1 to the uh, exponent, so r cubed. And uh, the derivative of one is just nothing. So uh, we're left with this expression here. Now the last thing we have to do for the third step is to multiply everything by r. So we'll have r times d over dr times v theta over r. So now we, we have our velocity profile here. We have uh, applied all the steps. So now I'm going to, to write this a little bit differently, but we'll have negative two uh, omega. Uh, we're multiplying by r here, so we'll have k squared. And we'll have one minus k squared. Uh, this will leave us with r squared, and multiplying by r, we'll have a little r squared on the bottom. Now what happens here is, uh, I'm not gonna to write it out and explain what the book is asking us to do, but when we learned this in class, um, the textbook that we are learning from had a different expression here uh, down at the bottom. Now, what we have to remember is that this k here um, is the ratio of the outer uh, surface radii to the inner surface radii. So, or or we can we can write this as k equals uh, yeah that's right k equals big R over little r. Or if we want to rearrange this expression, we can then get our little r is equal to k times r. Okay? Now, um, what we can do here is actually substitute this expression in for our little r here. Let me go on the other side here. So uh, substituting this in for r, we have negative two omega, uh, k squared, and then we'll have 1 minus k squared, 
and then we will substitute um, in for small r at the bottom. So uh, squaring this, because we have r squared here, we'll left up uh, with k squared times uh, r squared, big R squared. And what you'll notice is that uh, these two cancel and these two cancel. So what we're left with for the shear rate on the uh, inner cylindrical surface here uh, is negative two omega times one minus k squared. So we're gonna need this to calculate the torque um, on the, the, inner, uh, so the inner cylinder here, the one that's doing the rotating. Now, uh, another thing to note here is that um, in this uh, derivation for this, not derivation, but just substituting in one equation and another, uh, we notice that we end up with a negative value here. Now, it's not something to be too concerned with because torque can be measured in one way with a positive value and the other way with a negative value or vice versa, just depending on where um, you set positive and where you set negative, counterclockwise or clockwise. So we can go ahead and take this expression and now we can conceptually look at, okay, what do we know here and how can we calculate the torque for the inner cylinder? So now we need to calculate the torque for the inner uh, circle here. So we know that torque equals force multiplied by the lever arm. In our case, the lever arm for this case would just be the inner radius uh, for looking at the torque for the, the inner cylinder here. Now, uh, we also know that from Newton's law of viscosity that uh, shear stress equals viscosity uh, times the shear rate. Okay, so that's Newton's law for viscosity. Now, we also know that um, uh, shear stress also equals force divided by area. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look here at our torque. So I have the torque at R equals RI, so at the, the inner circle here. Um, we'll have this is equal to F times RI, again, force multiplied by the lever arm or the radius of the inner circle here. Now, uh, substituting in here, we can substitute the force. If we change this expression around, force is just equal to the shear stress times the area. So substituting this in, we will have uh, the shear stress at R equals Ri. And then multiplying this by the area, we will have uh, two pi Ri times the height and then multiplying by our uh, lever arm here, we cannot forget this, uh, is our I. Now, uh, what we can do here is we can actually uh, substitute in um, for the shear uh, stress expression here, because we have Newton's law for viscosity, which is viscosity times shear rate. And um, this is why I derived, or, or simply plugged these in to get the, uh, the shear rate of the inner circle here, because now it's just a simple plug-in um, and we can compare the torque for the, the inner circle and the outer circle. So we'll have uh, T at the uh, inner uh, cylinder here and substituting in we'll have viscosity. And then our shear rate here, which we found earlier is two omega times one or excuse me, divided by one minus k squared, um, and then multiplying this by our area, two pi ri squared times the height. So I just brought this ri in, ri in uh, so we have ri squared there. So this is the torque for the inner cylinder. Now we can uh, take a look at the torque for the outer cylinder and see um, what this is asking us to do, which is explain um, by expressions basically why these two torques need to be equal. So in order to get the torque applied on the outer cylinder, what we need to do is take uh, a look at what we found earlier, which is the uh, shear rate at any point in, in these, uh, between these two uh, cylinders here. So we found that it was equal to uh, R, we did R, should be R, uh, D over DR, 
the theta over r. And before we plugged in r equals ri, which it was equal to k times big R, uh, we had that this was equal to negative 2 omega k squared over 1 minus k squared. And this was multiplied by big R squared over small r squared. Now, before what we did was to find the uh, shear rate at the inner circle, we plugged in uh, ri equals k times r. Well, now what we can do is we want to find the uh, shear rate applied to the surface of the outer circle that is wetted. So that's the surface that's, that's in the process. So what we need to do here is find uh, shear rate at r equals uh, big R. So uh, just plugging in r equals big R, um, these two will just cancel out because we have big R squared over big R squared. So the shear rate at the outer uh, circle will be uh, negative two omega k squared over one minus k squared, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead, and since I'm running out of room here, I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite this at the top, and then we can, um, we want to find the torque at the the outer um, the outer cylinder, so we can apply the same process of force times the lever lever arm that we applied to find the torque at the the inner cylinder. So here uh, again we have shear rate at r equals big R. This is equal to negative two omega k squared over one minus k squared. So again finding the torque at r equals uh, big R. We have um, the shear stress times the cross-sectional area, so the shear stress at r equals big R. Cross-sectional area, 2 pi big R um, times the height multiplied by the lever arm at the end, which is big R. Now, uh, substituting in the uh, Newton's law for viscosity, we are left with T at the outer radius is equal to viscosity. Substituting in um, our shear rate, which we have found up here, uh, negating the negative, of course, is two omega k squared over one minus k squared. Uh, combining our r's here, we have two pi big r squared. Uh, times the height. So here is our expression here for the torque on the uh, outer uh, cylinder here. So what I'm going to do here is I have uh, written down here, this is just what we've built up so far, this is what we've been given and, and what we've found, and here is the torque uh, at the inner cylinder here. So let's go ahead and set these equal and see if, if everything really does cancel out um, and if it is true that the torque in the inner circle uh, must be equal to the torque applied at the outer circle. So the torque at the inner cylinder, which is, whoops, which is uh, mu, the marker's running out here. We go on this side here. So we have uh, mu uh, times two omega, so 2 omega over 1 minus k squared times uh, 2 pi ri squared times h. Okay, so let's go ahead and start canceling out terms um, that will obviously cancel on each side. So we have the viscosity mu cancels. We have 2 omega on each side cancels. We have uh, 2 pi on each side and that cancels and h also cancels. So um, now we can see what, uh, what we're left with, and that is that k squared over one minus k squared times r squared, or, or big R squared, I should say. Uh, this is equal to ri squared over one minus k squared. Now, if we take a look at this, uh, remember earlier that K is the ratio of the, um, the inner cylinder to the outer cylinder. 
And if we substitute this in, we remember that Ri equals K times big R. So if we substitute in K times big R and square that, we get K squared times big R squared over one minus K squared on each side. So it is true that the torque, again, looking at a cylindrical viscometer here, the torque that is applied on the inside, the, the part that is rotating, the torque on the outside must be applied in the same magnitude on the opposite direction in order for the entire apparatus to stay still. So um, just to recap, we were given the velocity profile and shear rate for cylindrical coordinates. Uh, we had to find the shear rate at both the surface of the inner cylinder and the surface of the outer cylinder. And from there, we were able to use uh, basic principle, principles such as uh, Newton's law for viscosity, um, also the expression for torque, which is force times the lever arm. And we have been able to show here at the bottom that it is true for, um, for the, the problem that we've been given. So that's it for this part one of homework. Thank you for watching.